So we are looking at a new series of lessons called Hold Fast. There's a word in your New Testament that is used in a number of places for hold fast. And the purpose of this is to set the uh, understanding for faithfulness through life, that we come to the Lord and are forgiven and uh, rejoice in the newfound freedoms in the spirit and have from there to continue to grow and to return and on God's investment and to live, but perhaps can uh, be in danger afterwards. And that's what this series is intended to look at, is what does it mean to hold fast? What does it take to hold fast? And hold fast to what? (laughs) Well, hold fast to the word is already the title of the lesson, so I think that's a spoiler. But, you know, we have... First of all, the parable of the sower. And I wanted to focus on the part of that parable that says, hold it fast, as in they hold fast the word. And, um, you know, because the parable can be used for many different things and and has been and, and rightly so. But I want to look at this aspect of it that is, you know, obviously has always been there, but it's good to focus in a little bit now and then. Right. So we have here in Luke chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, we we have this account of him beginning to tell the parable. um, In which we have four different kinds of hearts that are symbolized by four different uh, outcomes of seed that has been sown. And we're really focused on the good, but short of the good place to be sowing seed, there are other places and they describe the situations that we wish to avoid. And I don't want these things to be true for our brethren, but they are true. And so this parable is spoken as a warning and as a guide, something that is, you know, a heads up that this can happen and don't let this happen to you. Um, I'm going to read the same slide that you are because of my computer and my uh, lack of of glasses. (laughs) But this is big enough. I can read that. Uh, In Luke 8, 4 to 5, when a great crowd was gathering and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. So we have seed and it is sown, meaning he is scattering with the intent that this will grow into something and become a crop. As he sowed, some fell along the path, some was trampled underfoot, and the birds devoured it. But some fell along the path is what I'm looking for. Because if you fast forward to the explanation in verses 11 and 12, the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. So the thing being sown is the word. The word goes out. It lands on people's hearts. The ones along the path are those who have heard, and the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Meaning, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot. The birds of the air devoured it. That is, the meaning of that is the word of God lands on them, if you will. They hear the word, but then the devil comes and takes away the word from the heart so that they won't believe it, they won't be saved. For whatever reason, they're listening to the devil instead of the word. And so this person never believes the word of God. The word of God lands on them, but bounces off like the side of the road. Some fell on the rock. So what we're saying here is this person sowing, right, is working in a field. But as he goes along the edge of the field and he's sowing, some of the seed gets out of the property across the 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 line the property line right and there's a road along the property line some of the seed actually lands beside the road on the you know what we might call the shoulder which is no place for seed to grow the birds are going to eat that obviously 
But between the road and the property fence, there's going to be the rock, right? The, the, the little the ditch, the place on the side of the road there. That's where we are now. Some fell there. And as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. True, seed there on the median, if you will, or whatever that's called, the right of way, I don't know. It depends on your state, doesn't it? But whatever that's called can grow. I mean, there will be a little seedling, there will be a plant, you'll see something come, but not for long because there's no moisture. It withers. The ones on the rock, in verse 13, we are told by way of explanation, are those who, on hearing the word, receive it with joy, but have no root. They believe for a little while, and in time of testing, fall away. So this is about Christians. In the first case, somebody did not obey the gospel. They never believed it. Here, somebody believed this word. They received it with joy. But in time of testing, they fall away. So, you know, they're glad about the word. They hear the word. It makes sense to them. They believe in, in God, if you will. They're, they're happy about the message that God can save us. But when the time comes that you have to pay a price for this, because even though you're happy about it, not everybody else is happy about it. And your loved ones are mad at you, or your friends are mad at you, or your employer is mad at you, or it calls on you to do something that you don't want to do. You have to stop you know, living with your girlfriend, or you have to stop drinking, or whatever. All of a sudden, you know, there's rock. Not moisture underneath there. Meaning there's a stop, there's a hard stop. This far and no further. You know, I can't go with that. I'm, no, I'm not going to do this. Right? And that's where they fall. Started out good, but for a time, but when the test came, they fell. Then the third category of persons, the thorns. Some fell among thorns, verse 7 tells us. The thorns grew up with it and choked it. True. If the seed falls along the fence where you have the thorns the hedges you know to keep people out it'll grow but it'll never produce fruit as for what fell among the thorns verse 14 tells us they are those who hear but as they go on their way they're choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life and their fruit does not mature this is the one that i think is uh, particularly frightening Right in the first case, this person never obeyed. In the second case, a person became a Christian, but then they didn't last very long. Something came up, you know, the time came to pay a price for serving the Lord, and they weren't willing. They fell away. They're not Christians anymore. They've left the Lord. They've left, forsaken him. In this third category, you have a Christian, and they're still there. There's a plant but it's not bearing any fruit or what little fruit it has never reaches maturity as in it's, it's not usable. It's misshapen, undergrown, whatever, because it's in thorns. It's not getting the sun, the water, right? The freedom of motion that it needs to produce useful fruit. It can't do this. And that is a Christian who is alive, who is, who is, you know there but they're not bringing fruit because they're choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life right it, it, this world is too much with us somebody once said and it's true the world is too much with us we have got to remember that there is only one important thing and it's god and the service of him is what this life is about we're supposed to glorify him and this world is going to end, and its pleasures are going to be brought to an end as well. There will not be anything left except for whether or not you have done right. That will go with you after this is done, but nothing else. And we have to remember that sometimes. 
This is saying we can be choked. So there's still a plant. I mean, and you, you're, you're, you know, tempted to say, well, I'm a Christian. Yes, but your job is not to be a Christian. Your job is to bear fruit. You have to be a Christian to have a shot at bearing fruit. <laughs> but bearing fruit is what we're called to do. Obviously, you can't do it if you're not a Christian. That's not even possible. But the fact that you're a Christian is not enough. And finally, he said, as some, uh, some seed fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. Also true. When the word of God lands in it with an honest person, where it should, where it's intended to, to land, it produces a crop. And, you know, a seed that makes a plant is going to make hundreds of other seeds when it reaches maturity. As for the, the, the seed that went to the good soil, verse 15 explains, there are those who hearing the word hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. Patience meaning endurance. They hear the word, they hold it fast in an honest and good heart. So our heart is honest with God and with self. And it's good. It desires to do what God wants. Holds the word fast. And then bears fruit with patience. Meaning it takes endurance. you got to make it through tough times if you want to bring fruit. And it's true. That's the way it is. And that's how we glorify God. That's how plants give us good food. But it's also how we give God good glory. And... The other thing I guess we would take note of is the word hold fast. It's hold down. Hold, you know, it's the idea is that you, you're like holding something down. It, it doesn't turn. Um, you've locked it in place somehow. It's, that's the meaning of hold fast. And it's, you know, securely fastened, we might say, in another way of fashioning that, that same word. That you have got this. Uh, it's not moving. It's not giving. They hear the word. They hold on to the word. And with patience, they come to bear fruit. That's what we want to be. We, we want to be that heart. And I will take note of the next verse, which should not be ignored. I think the, the next verse is the application actually people look at it and they say well this is how it is to become a christian yeah but that's like i mean that's like companies focusing on acquisition and not caring about customer service right <laughs> luke eight sixteen. no one after lighting a lamp covers it up with a jar or puts it under a bed that's not why you lit it right he puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light why did he say that well because you he's so sow the seed of the word you hold the word and bring it forth he didn't do this so that you would remain hidden <laughs> doing nothing saying nothing accomplishing nothing influencing no one that's not what you're supposed to do as a child of god you are supposed to be a light that shines in the world we shine uh, as lights among a crooked generation when we say no one lights a lamp and covers it up, you're saying that that's kind of useless, isn't it? Yes. Well, put yourself in God's shoes. That's all. We're, we're being invited to do that. Put yourself in God's shoes. He sowed the word. He wants to get and invest a return on that word. That word should be multiplied in our mouths. All right. Next point is... Unless you believed in vain, 1 Corinthians 15. This goes back to the earlier examples of the seed in which we saw that people can hear the word and disbelieve or hear the word, receive the word with joy even and still fall away because there's something down there that won't let it go any further. People can choke in the cares of the world 
The other way of saying that is they believed in vain, in vain for nothing. It accomplished nothing. They heard the word, they believed it, but it didn't go anywhere. They fell away or they're still here, but they're not bearing any fruit. That's in vain. First Corinthians 15, in the first four verses, he said, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached, which you received, in which gospel you stand, and by which gospel you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, meaning he received this from God. It wasn't something we made up. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Resurrection from the dead is what this is about. Why is that? Because obeying the gospel is putting to death the old person of sin and being resurrected in Christ Jesus, a new person. What you're saying is, People can change. With the help of God, by the grace of God, people can change. You can be saved. You can become something different. Tomorrow does not have to look like yesterday. That's resurrection. God can raise the dead. He said, you're being saved by holding to this if Rather, if you hold fast to the word I preached, unless you believed in vain. Now, this is, that's a scary thing. We have the word, and the word is a powerful word about resurrection and the fact that people can change and can be forgiven. You have to believe that, and you have to stay with it. I think maybe people give up when they think it's just never going to get better. It's never going to change. I won't ever accomplish or whatever it is. That's, you know, that's the devil saying that. The word of God doesn't say that. God preaches resurrection from the dead. You say, well, but I'm pretty bad off. I'm like, yeah, yeah, there's bad off and then there's dead, <laughs> right? <laughs> and God raises the dead, let alone bad off. I mean, he healed the sick. He healed the paralytics. He gave sight to the blind, but more than that, he raises the dead. More than all that, he raises the dead, and he forgives sins, which is harder than to say to the paralytic, take up your bed and walk. So, don't believe in vain on the one hand. Believe in the resurrection, that Jesus was raised. This is the first importance you have to trust God that change is real, that repentance is real, that, to, that you know, a new person is a reality and that that can be you. One of the things that he says here about this is in verse 32 that I thought was particularly uh, poignant on this. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. This idea about fighting with beasts at Ephesus it was, you know, one of these things where you could be really cool and glorious, celebrated, and, you know, by winning um, in some contest with wild animals that they had. It's kind of crazy. But why, he said, you know, they think of that as being full of life, full of energy. You know, you think of perhaps the um, running of the bulls in Pamplona. Um, you know, this idea of youthful exuberance, full of life, uh, full of energy, you know, facing the odds, overcoming, that kind of thing is what people are investing in it. Um, I don't know how much Ephesus was like Pamplona, but it's, it's none of those things in, in Pamplona. <laughs> People are doing that because they're drunk. But what if, he said, if the dead are not raised, let's eat and drink, tomorrow we die. You know, the point that he's making here is no matter what you're accomplishing or think you're accomplishing in the world, it's useless. 
tomorrow we die. We, we have no promise of tomorrow. We have no promise of life. Those things have no end. They have no real lasting purpose the way that the Word of God does and the resurrection of the Spirit does. This idea, let us eat and drink, tomorrow we die, just very, you know, truthful saying from the Old Testament, pointing to the idea that, well, you know, if there's no resurrection, well, there's no accountability and there's no future. So you just live for today, do what you want, do what you like. That's the way of the world. But you can see that the allure of this idea, because people can get caught up in, well, there's glory in this, there's celebration in this. Um, you know, you can be cool, you can be well fed, you can be well liked. Uh, you know, but these are all empty promises. They all fade with time. And the other thing he said is be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because you know in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Now this is back to the endurance of the parable of the sower, that they bore fruit with patience, bear fruit with endurance. He's saying, brethren, you know, you can be steadfast, you can be immovable, you can be always abounding in the work because you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Meaning the work you're doing in the Lord will have a result. It's not in vain, it will bear fruit. There is life after death, there is a, a judgment, and you can conquer despite the judgment. And this will fuel your work and give you endurance. Guard the mind in this world to overcome sin and to stick it out, to hold fast. Don't let go. The other thing that is darker, 2 Peter chapter 2, needs to be said, we have to realize the seriousness of falling away. It's so serious that the Lord said it would have been better never to have known the way of righteousness. In 2 Peter 2, verses 18 through 22, we read about, uh, we read the conclusion about false teachers that began in chapter 2, verse 1. Speaking loud boasts of folly, false teachers enticed by sensual passions of the flesh, those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. And this is true, there are so many lies in this world. Loud boasts of folly. It sounds confident. It's played loud. <laughs> Meaning, this is everywhere. People say it and assert it so confidently, and you can hear it in so many different places. It's just the conventional wisdom. And they entice by sensual desire, sensual passions of the flesh, those who barely escape from those that live in error. Meaning, Christians who have obeyed but are just not mature yet, that are not strong, they're among the seed that fell in the rocks, right? Or the seed that fell um, among the thorns. The error comes and they accept it, they put up with it, and it has this sensual desires of the flesh. It just means they're not fully spiritual. They're not mature. And whatever is for sale in this error, because error is always selling something. Whatever is for sale in this error, that's the thing that they want. That's the desire of the flesh that they have. It's the mechanism. They promise freedom, but themselves are slaves of corruption. It sounds like freedom, but it's not freedom. People think, well, I do what I want. 
That's freedom. Eh, but it's not, though. You're actually serving the devil when you do that. Whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. Right? That's the problem. People ask sometimes about cigarettes. Is it wrong to smoke? Like, well, can you not smoke? Well, that's, that's pretty hard. Have you ever tried not to? Well, yeah. Could you do it? No. All right, so who's in control here? And who's supposed to be in control here? So I don't answer the question, right? <laughs> or isn't it obvious? I don't have to answer, do I? Whatever overcomes a person to that, he is enslaved. If, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Christ, if, after this, they are again entangled in them and are overcome by this, then the latter state has become worse than their first state had been. It would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. Yeah, that's pretty terrible if you think about it. We have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, but then they come back. His word was enough to pull you out of those things, and now you're going to get entangled and dragged back into them? Why are you retreading that? Why are you going there again? The latter state is worse. He says it's worse, better never to have known it than having known it to turn back. Why? Well, the reason why is because when you don't know the truth and somebody speaks the truth, you've never heard it before. You're at the part where the sower goes out to sow. You have a chance to hear something you've never heard, the power of God's word. But when you've already heard that and you know what God wants and you choose to do differently, what are we going to say to you now? I can only point to the same verses that you already know. There was a man... Uh, I know about this. Uh, this happened some time ago, and I don't really care to give you the names because it's not terribly pertinent to the lesson, although I'm willing to do so if you want to know about it later. Anyway, there was a fella um, who was brought to do a gospel meeting in a, in a congregation by the elders there because the elders had a problem with uh, pornography in the congregation, pornography in, in the midst of the congregation. And the, the fella came and He's a very well-known uh, gospel preacher at a very, you know, well-known congregation of size and money. And, you know, his lessons were, were terrible. They were terrible. I mean, they were all psychology. He explained how uh, dopamine works in the brain and how it's released and the chemical reactions there that associate what you're doing with uh, pleasure and, you know, it's like the modern psychology theory of addiction or addictive tendencies anyway. Um, and there was a question and answer session that they recorded and they also released. So I heard that too. And in this question and answer session, some fella, the poster child, you know, my buddy, I, I don't actually know who it was, but somebody asked him, you know, saying, look, you, you taught us a lot of things about psychology. Why didn't you just use the Bible verses that condemn, you know, lust and fornication and, you know, all this. In the, you know what the preacher said, why he did not do that? I will tell you. He said, well, it's not like they don't know that. Not like they don't know that. Oh, okay. So what does that mean? <laughs> so if the Bible doesn't work, well, let's try something else. Are we really down there with Groucho Marx? These are my principles. If you don't like them, I have others. <laughs> really? 
No. He said, well, you know, it's not like they don't know that. Well, it is like they don't know that because they're doing it. You teach that. Well, but, you know, how's that going to make them stop? Well, it's not. But if they don't stop, then you withdraw from them because they are walking in sin. They're walking disorderly. They need to be disciplined. You don't go along with it. You don't keep looking for ways to make them stop. You preach the word. And if they are not willing to accept the word, then they have to be disciplined. That's what the Bible teaches. But see, there's the rub, isn't it? Because that's exactly what those elders did not want to do. Isn't it? That's exactly what they didn't want to do. Because they were not willing to do what God said about this, they, you know, that ear was pretty itchy. They went whistling and found a dog they could bring who, you know, they found somebody who would come and scratch that ear. It worked, right? Would have been better never to have known the way than having known it to turn back, right? Meaning, what are we going to say to help you? It, the, the word pulled you out of that. Now you're going back to it. I don't have anything else but the word. Now, some of these other guys, yeah, they're willing to do psychology. They're going to do whatever it takes to get the money, just like Balaam. But I am not. I'm going to teach the truth. And it's not about me. I'm just saying, friend, you're the same way. I know you are. That's why you're here. Because you love the Bible. You love the truth. Nothing else is going to work. If they don't listen to the Bible, they don't listen. Period. End of story. There's nothing else you can do. The word of God is foolishness with those who are perishing. You can't change that. So many Christians spending so much effort to turn the foolishness of God's word into wisdom. That's what all of the, you know, uh, evidences, lessons are about. They're all trying to turn the foolishness of God's word into wisdom. That's futile. God's word is foolish <laughs> by this world's standards. And it doesn't matter. You know, I mean, you can try to explain away whatever you want to. You, it's never going to be possible that Jesus came out of that grave. That is never going to be scientifically possible under any circumstance. You can explain away, you know, your evolution timeline. You can explain away, your, you know, your whatever, your gender biases, your sexual preferences. I mean, whatever. You can try to find a way to make the Bible compatible with whatever the, you know, error du jour is in the world. But it is never going to be the case that you will solve the basic problem of first importance, 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus is raised from the dead. So that's a futile effort. I suggest you get back to the word of God. The true proverb says, the dog returns to its vomit, which is true. The sow, after washing, returns to wallow in the mire. It's also true. Yes, the dog returns to its vomit which you don't want them to do outside. Inside, I might let them do it and then send them outside. But no, no, you're not, it's nasty, right? <laughs> I, I can't believe they do this, but they do. And as Brother Leroy Cly said, that's why they're dogs. <laughs> I owe him a lot in life because he introduced me to dogs. He gave us our first dog. The sow returns to wallow in the mire. True, you can wash the pig off, but it's just going to go right back to the dirt. <laughs> the true proverb has become true in their case. They've turned away from God, and this is how it ends up. That's the result. That's a big, you know, yikes. Ugh, that is nasty. And it's true. When we fall away from God, we're going back to the weak and beggarly elements. We're going back to... Things of the world that shouldn't be tricky, that shouldn't have tricked us. Things that we said we would give up. Things that we promised God we would keep ourselves from as we would be faithful to him. So this is not, you know, um, it's, it's not from God a plea. It's from God, you know, God is calling you to do what is right. It is from me a plea, though, because I'm a fellow servant with you. Uh, you know, stick with the truth. Stick with the Bible. You know, stay the course, hold fast, because this life is a short ride. 
Uh, and there's a lot of things in here that are um, tricky, a lot of things that entice, a lot of things that are hard to understand. And there are so many that teach error, and there's so much in the world that is convincing. But you've got to stay above those things as a Christian. You, and it's not, you know, by being, you know, outsmarting everybody, uh, knowing everything. No, it's by your faith in God. You're trusting God's word to prescribe what you ought to have and be and do. Turn to God's word for how you should do this thing, how you should be, whatever it is. If you're thinking to marry, if you're thinking, you know, to work, if you're whatever it is. Turn to God's word. Let God's word show you what is the right way to behave, how to conduct yourself. And don't listen to these other voices in the world. Well, we have a lot more to talk about with Holdfast. There are a number of other examples in the scriptures. Hebrews talks about it a lot and uh, some other places that we should look at. But for another time. If today you are not a Christian, it's time to obey the gospel because there's no other time but the present. <laughs> if you need to obey the gospel, we have water here prepared that you might do so. Uh, we're ready to stand, uh, you know, and, and help. There's garments, there's water. We're ready to take care of what needs to be done to allow you to accomplish the commandment of God, to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins on Based on your repentance, your change of heart, if you will, you're putting to death the old person so that you might be resurrected from the water of baptism, having been washed in the blood of Christ from, you know, the mire of this world. Are you a Christian who has fallen away? Come back to God. And like I said, I don't have anything else to offer, just the Bible. <laughs> and nothing else is going to work anyway. The Bible's the only thing that works. But recognize where you've fallen from. Recognize how God sees this as, you know, the current state is worse than when you didn't even know anything about God. Make things right with him and come back and be forgiven. And there are people who have done this. There are people here today who have done this. Let them be an encouragement to you. Let them have words of wisdom for you. If we can obey, uh, help you to obey the gospel, if we can help you in our prayers for your spiritual need, for a restoration to the Lord, uh, for strength in the spirit, let us pray for, for you and with you. Let us help you to be baptized by coming to the front now while together we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs>